Hey everyone, welcome to another Ask GN. As always, you can leave your questions in the comments section below and we'll try to get to them for next week. Uh, for this week, we have a few interesting questions, including where are all of the GPUs? Many of you know that answer already. What was Intel thinking with the current KB Lake X launch? And then we'll be talking about some other user questions as well, including uh, things about bloatware and liquid cooling, Xbox One versus PC type of discussion, all that. So before getting to that, this one is brought to you by our own store. So store.gamersnexus.net. Uh, we just restocked these shirts. These are the tri-blend graph shirts. They are they're pretty cool. I like this logo a lot, actually. But just restocked them. They've been out for a few weeks. So uh, they're on store.gamersnexus.net now if you're interested. But let's get into the questions. So the first one to discuss is probably the what was Intel thinking question that we just posted the KB Lake X review for the 7740X. And if you haven't seen it, check it out. But more or less the conclusion was, why does this exist? Not only is it, it's, it's a refresh, which it's okay for refreshes to exist as long as they provide something. This refresh is on a different motherboard than, than the original, than its predecessor. So that makes it kind of weird because you can't upgrade from a, an existing Z270 board and move from something like a G4560 into a 7740X. It's not possible, physically impossible to do it. So uh, that's, that's why I guess the question is, what are they doing and why? Well, there's a few things here. First of all, uh, it's important, I think, to point out that the technology for the CPUs is still fine. It, there are problems like with the thermals because we saw, again, with overclocking, we were able to pretty routinely hit 100 Celsius with the 7740X, a Kraken X62 maxed out for the pump and the fans, getting pretty hot. But uh, as far as able to perform work and do various workloads, AVX support is pretty good on Skylake X, and uh, the CPUs function fine. The technology is there, the architecture isn't brand new, it's all fairly well optimized for by developers already, so they have a good foundation. It just seems kind of like Intel is throwing a lot of that away with this launch. And part of that, I think, is largely the price argument where you can have great technology, but if it, the price doesn't make sense for your audience, then it's sort of irrelevant. And then also just an unexciting launch for enthusiasts who aren't building HEDT systems or high-end desktop systems. So that's, that's the thing to point out first is that this is not a messy launch, and it's definitely fair to say it's a messy launch for Intel if you look at like all the media coverage, basically. Um, so it, it's not a messy launch because the technology is extremely flawed or anything like that. There are some problems with BIOS, but uh, the CPUs themselves are more or less fine, other than the thermals. So what's the problem then? Well, the problem is with AMD and Ryzen, now there's suddenly a a point of comparison where you can look at the R7 CPUs and if you're building an HEDT system and you're an enthusiast who does some Blender rendering or some Premiere rendering or things like that on the side and it's CPU accelerated, maybe for physics or whatever, then Ryzen makes good sense and it's cheap. The i9 CPUs are very power hungry, so they're flawed in that way. They can run hot, but not all of them do. It kind of depends. The i7s run hot and uh, are not particularly exciting, and they are not cheap either. So the i9, $1,000. Um, and at a 10-core part, that's still $700 cheaper than Intel's last 10-core part. So normally, without perspective, that would look pretty good. You'd be like, wow, you can get a 10-core part for $700 less than last year. Great. But then you look around, and the 8-core Ryzen parts are at, uh, we're ignoring the 1800X because it's, it's superfluous. But the 1700 is like 300 bucks right now. You can overclock it and be pretty competitive with the i9 CPU for rendering tasks. It does fall short in some ways. Like the, I, I mean, it's just slower. It's a little bit slower overall, but that makes sense. It's got fewer threads. But if you're willing to sacrifice some of the speed and save a lot of the money, then it's not a bad trade. So that's, that's one part of it, is just the perspective provided by AMD now. Competition's a good thing. Now another thing here, I guess I'll point out the i5-7640X. What was Intel thinking with that? My answer to you is, I have no idea. I, I do not know why an i5 would exist on 
the X299 platform. It makes zero sense. You're all of the motherboards will be more expensive than the CPU. And it's Intel's reasoning, if you didn't see our 7740X review, here's what they told us at their press event. When we said, why does KB Lake X exist? With almost exact words. Their answer was that it was a CPU built with the intention of someone getting it to get into the high-end desktop enthusiast platform at a lower price. Okay, so you're buying a $300 plus dollar motherboard and a $200 something $40 CPU with an i5 or $330 with the i7 and replacing it with an i9 later? Who does that? That, that has got to be the smallest possible market they could target uh, other than just desktop in general, I guess. And that leads into the next point, which is Intel for a while now has been less focused on the desktop market as a whole. Enthusiasts are really helping out the computer market right now. Uh, our audience and our demographic, the enthusiast audience, is really the only one that's profitable growing and driving sales in desktop computers. The Best Buy off-the-shelf desktop computer is dead. No one buys those anymore. If they go to a store and you're kind of a, uh, to use Kingpin's term from our interview, they're a daily, a daily user, you go to a store, you probably buy a laptop, most people. Uh, so that just leaves really enthusiasts and production studios who are buying desktops. And Intel has been in it a long time, and they've been in a lead for a long time, and they have so much money that they've, or at least they have assets, I should say, that they've diversified across other areas. And some of them they've not done so well. Mobile certainly has been failed a number of times at this point by Intel. Uh, but they're trying to diversify self-driving cars, for instance. And that's because Intel can see the writing on the walls. They know that desktop is not going to be around forever, at least for the consumer audience. It's not worth really targeting for them. Enthusiasts, you would hope, would be worth targeting. But ultimately, as much as we can say that we and you and our audience were all driving growth in this sector, the fact of the matter is that enthusiast desktop users are probably like 1% of the market. The rest is things like enterprise, which is a far more profitable sector of the market. Intel targets that still pretty well, uh, though they've got Epic to look out for soon. But that's part of it. So to kind of recap those, i5, no idea what they're doing. The i7 7740X, they say is for upgrading later. We don't agree with that. It's kind of misguided, especially because they took out the IGP, and that's one of the things where if you were going to upgrade later, you'd probably upgrade the GPU later, and that's not on there. Uh, so you'd have to buy one anyway. The technology is more or less fine. It's definitely got some flaws, but they're the same flaws we've seen in the past with KB Lake non-X. And, uh, and then you're looking at basically just the desktop market drying up in a way that Intel a long time ago probably started shifting gears and saying we need to we need to make sure we have a safety net if this thing really collapses. So I think that's a lot of it. Um, the PCIe lane count was certainly kind of a weird decision for some of the processors where the lane count's lower than it maybe needs to be. I don't know that it's the worst decision they've made. Uh, I think it's kind of blown a little out of proportion, but that's not to say it's not a problem. It's just of all the things to, to pick on Intel for, there are plenty of other options right now. I would, like to see, I would like to see enough pressure on Intel with regard to thermals that they start moving to either better thermal compound or to solder or something like that for these larger dyes. Um, I don't know. It, the whole launch is kind of weird. It's, it's weird for a lot of reasons that we kind of discussed too in the X299 coverage is remarkably poor performing video where X299 is confusing people who aren't dedicated followers of technology because they're like, what the heck, X399 is out, why aren't you covering that? So that's hard enough for people. And then it's also got a new socket that is, is used for what should be an 1151 part. If you look at the KB Lake X parts, they have basically an 1151 substrate on top of a 2066 substrate. Um, all the way down to the golden arrow in the corner. So I don't know. I, that's kind of just some loose, unstructured thoughts on all of it. If you want more of the structure, you can go to the reviews, of course. 7740X review is up. 
pretty critical. 7900 X review was very critical of Intel's marketing, which is just something that we do in general. But the marketing was was kind of was kind of bad for this launch. So I don't know. They need to get their stuff together. They really need to get their marketing together, especially because it's just there are things that the CPUs do well that weren't mentioned, and there are things that the CPUs don't do better than existing products on the market that were mentioned as champions of the new line, like VR, when we clearly show that that's not the case. They can pretty much everything of a higher price class, 300 and up, can do VR just fine. So I, I don't know. That's loose thoughts there. Uh, very quickly, the question I've seen in a few places, why are there no GPUs on sale? It's because of the cryptocurrency boom. As I understand it, there was some kind of shuffling in the other markets internationally. I think I read that India and China had some big influence on the value of cryptocurrencies right now. And so you've got a boom. And because GPUs are used to uh, mine, it's called, if you're not familiar, used to mine the uh, cryptocurrency, they're selling out everywhere because people who do mining as a dedicated way of either making money or just a hobby or whatever, they bought all the cards because gaming cards just happen to be pretty good at mining as well. So they're not in stock. And this has happened before. It happened in 2014 when there was a boom last time and then there was a big crash after that and the market was flooded with video cards. So if you are building a new system, I am so sorry for the market you're entering right now because you're, you're building a system at a time when RAM prices are high and there are no video cards. So th that kind of sucks. Uh, my advice to you would be wait a little bit on the GPUs. If you catch one when it restocks somewhere and it's not overpriced, then just pick it up, I guess. Um, you can also check for used GPUs or B stock. This is something a lot of people forget about. So other than just actually used from Craigslist or whatever GPUs, a lot of the video card vendors will sell B stock and RMA, RMA or open box cards. So you could go to, for example, EVGA it has a B stock listing on their site where they have basically cards that were one tick away from A stock or being sold retail. Maybe they've been refurbished, sent in by a user, needed to replace thermal pads or whatever, and they put it up for sale. That's an example of a B stock card. So check places like that. It's not a bad deal right now to buy something like a 980 Ti for hopefully a little less than 200 bucks and uh, or right around there anyway. Uh, and use that in the interim and then maybe spin it later for another 150 or whatever you can get out of it. But otherwise I'd say wait or buy, buy used if you can find something that's cheap. Uh, 1050 Ti's are still an okay price. So that's, that's good. Uh, they're not that great at mining, I guess. So 1050 Ti might be a good fallback card if you can use it and then throw it in another system later and upgrade. Um, but that's the answer to that one. Now the first question from our audience, as opposed to just the internet in general, uh, is from B10 Rain, who said, big fan, love the videos. My question is pretty simple. I was wondering if there was some basic protocol for cleaning dust from a graphics card. I have a 980 Ti due for cleaning. I do not have the experience of taking off the air cooler unit. Is there a standard way to clean it without removing the cooler? And is there anything to avoid or be wary of? I don't want to damage it with pressured air when I should be using a safer method. So a few things here. Um, it depends on the card. Some of the, I don't, I don't know that I've seen it on NVIDIA cards lately, but uh, on some of the XFX and Sapphire cards, you can actually really easily just remove the fan. So that's one thing to keep in mind for some of you. And if you can do that, then great. You don't really need to do anything else. Just pull the fan out. Now, if it's a blower design reference card, uh, it's a little harder to get in there and get the dust out. I would probably recommend starting with the compressed air. Anti-static compressed air is what you should start with. The places like Staples sell it. Anti-static compressed air. Uh, try and blow that through there. If, if you know it's bad inside, then it's not too terribly difficult to remove the uh, leftmost part of the shroud. So we have videos of the process, but um, there are maybe uh, I want to say eight screws involved in that process and they are Allen key screws for the reference cards. You pull those out and then the shroud is just metal. You're not going to hurt it. It's a piece of metal. You're, there's, no, there's no issue of shorting anything. So you pull that out. Obviously the card is unplugged at this point and hopefully on a 
a, a non-insulating surface, so like a hardwood table or something like that. Technically, wood can insulate, but you get the idea. And not not carpet. And um, once you've gotten that off, then you have direct access to the uh, vapor chamber or the heat sink, and you can just blow the can on that and get everything out of there. Alternatively, for people with axial air-cooled cards, like the dual air design, actually this is kind of what I'm talking about. This isn't a common design anymore, 7850. Um, so with a card like where you've got a fan more like this, maybe two of them, there are, and there are on this one, three screws that if you move the blades just right, you'll see them. They're Phillips screws on every card I've worked with. And you just remove those screws and you can pull the fan out. You have to be a little bit careful because it's not necessarily easy to get the fan back in there. Uh, so try to be careful about how you move the cable or if you move the cable. But if you can just loosen it enough that it's no longer stuck against the heat sink, you can spray that off or maybe get an anti-static cloth in there and clean all the, all the dirt up, like basic, basically a static clean type of thing, but without the static. So um, those would be my suggestions. Cleaning cards is not that difficult. Uh, just be a little adventurous with the shroud. Normally the shroud is not really going to expose you to anything that you can damage. The only thing to watch out for is the cables because there are cables attached from the shroud to the board. So when you're removing the shroud, uh, don't, don't pull the cables by the wires. Try and pull by the base of it um, or you can snap the cables out, which I've done. But the difference is I don't care. So uh, that's hopefully that helps with that one. Next one, Tie Finder says, Ask Gamers Nexus, hi Steve. The bloatware issue was very informative. What still interested me, now I have a lot of extra software from Cam, NZXT, Corsair Link, RAM, uh, MSI, Dragon Eye, Mystic Light for the GPU, G Skill motherboard software, and many other control software in my system. Do these slow down the PC? The short answer is maybe. It depends on the software. Some of it's written worse than others. Cam used to be really bad, NZXT Cam. They've gotten a lot better. It still has a lot of problems with it, but it's nowhere near as bad as it was before. The resource intensive aspect of Cam has more or less been removed at this point. Uh, now it's just general bugginess, but it's not like as resource intensive as it used to be. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a problem where <laughs> You buy a keyboard and a mouse and a headset from different vendors, and now you have three software solutions you have to install to use them. That kind of sucks. But that's, that's the way they do it, because they want you to buy all from the, the one vendor, obviously. Um, so yes, the short answer is it is definitely going to impact the boot time if they're launching at boot. And it might impact general CPU utilization, which can impact other things lightly. For example, if we run Cinebench and something like uh, Windows updates running and taking a couple percent of the resources in the background, we'll actually see that result, the change in numbers in Cinebench. So that's a really good way to validate performance with a, a clean boot versus a bloated boot. But my suggestion would be you can go into msconfig. It used to be msconfig.exe. I think, yeah, Microsoft has now moved all of that into Task Manager. So you can open Task Manager, click on Startup, and then comb through there find anything you do not need immediately at startup and disable it and reboot to apply. And then once you boot back in, things like, let's say, let's say you don't need MSI Dragoneye, let's say you don't need the NZXT Cam or Corsair Link software at boot, they won't boot up, your system will start up at a normal pace and then you launch them when you need them. Alternatively, you can create a really simple batch file and basically do a start command so you have like uh, disable it from the startup list in task manager you make a batch file dot bat uh, and then you would do a uh, some basically put it in a startup folder a timeout or something like that delayed start basically is what i'm after and launch the software after some time delay alternatively you could use windows task scheduler and start software up there and the reason you would do that is so you can stagger the boot so that it boots up quickly and normally, and then maybe five minutes later you have cam and link pop up. That way you can still do things like get to Chrome and your email and whatever immediately when it turns on without any unnecessary delay. Um, but yeah, it probably impacts performance. 
Next question. 1157 Strange Kid said, with the recent announcement of the X Xbox One XX claiming 4K for $500, do you think you can try to put together a build for a similar price that could achieve the same thing? It would be interesting, an interesting spin to make two rigs, one with one new and one used to try and get the most performance per dollar possible. PS, since 60 FPS was only promised for Forza, it is only fair that you aim for 4K 30 or better. That's reasonable. Uh, yeah, so this is, I like the idea of doing used and new. That's the probably the most unique angle because um, I think just a straight build isn't too, too immediately interesting. But here's the thing. We can do that. Certainly, it might be worth doing. I probably wouldn't title it like console killer or Xbox One is relevant or whatever. Because the thing is, they have a place in the market, the consoles, and ultimately, if you have the exact same hardware in every single thing you're programming for, all the Xbox, and uh, then it's much easier to develop for. And that's why you see the Xboxes and the Playstations and whatever that's out there able to achieve the level of fidelity they can, other than, of course, things like cheating with checkerboard rendering and things like that. But they can achieve that level of fidelity largely because the developers can optimize for the shaders because they know what they are and how they work and where they are, um, as opposed to a desktop where you have probably millions of possible configurations and who knows what's going on. So a, in a one-to-one -one configuration, a console will probably most of the time beat a PC in terms of fidelity for frame rate but the PCs are obviously customizable, so you can go a whole lot further. Uh, that's not to say either one's better, it's to say that they're not necessarily something you need in a head-to-head -head all the time because the consoles fill a different market and they're very well optimized for because it's one set of hardware and Microsoft controls it all. So that makes it easy for developers, which means that you're probably not gonna see an APU do as well in a desktop as you would in a console. But yeah, it's an interesting idea. We could do something like that. I'm sure for, for what, 500 bucks? We did a build like that recently with a G4560 and a 1050 Ti, but I think you could fit in the budget of a cheap 570 or a cheap 470 if the GPU prices weren't crazy right now and you'd actually be still at around $500. And that would be a pretty damn capable rig and the 4560 won't bottleneck those two cards that much as we tested. So I, I think you could do it. I don't know that I need to do it, but um, that would be where I'd start. And then in terms of benchmarking, uh, that's not going to be possible till the thing comes out, but you should be able to beat the 4K 30 with uh, sacrificing all of your settings down to something like low and medium. We can look into it, though. I don't know why you'd want to play 4K 30 if you have a $500 computer, but it would be, I guess it'd be a fun test, and that'd be about the start and the end of it, not necessarily practical. 1080p 60 is definitely possible though with the four and five hundred dollar computers that we've built and as we showed with the 4560 and 1050 ti build uh, it's not too hard to hit 1080p 60 uh, or even a bit higher than that i think we we're doing 100 fps in overwatch at 1080p with some settings tuning so really not bad for 500 bucks next question uh very quickly david martins says why nvme has four pcie slots or lanes when the physical drive can only read at 600 megabytes per second, wouldn't two by PCIe be enough? So the thing with this is the drive there, it's a little confusing, but it's kind of an old topic now. NVMe is a protocol. PCIe is an interface where you get the lanes out of. Um, just because a drive is a PCIe drive that can fit it into, well, let me rephrase that. Just because a drive is an M.2 drive and fits into an M.2 SSD slot, does not mean that it will use anything other than SATA. It might just pull from the SATA interface, at which case you're getting your 500, 550, 600 megabyte per second limitation. Uh, if it's pulling from PCIe and the drive itself and the controller can handle more performance than 600 megabytes per second, then you get the boost. And if it's NVMe enabled, and again, the controller and the NAND can keep up, then you could use the four-way PCIe, four-tap PCIe, configuration uh, to, to fill something like two gigabytes per second on some of the SSD. It's not, it's not too common yet, but uh, two gigabytes per second is getting more common, or at least getting close to it. One gigabyte per second is fairly common at this point and achievable. So you can definitely leverage the lane count, but again, it's gotta be something that's not using the SATA interface or protocol over a different interface like M.2.
Next question, last, or is this the last one? Last question for now is from Chettle. One week ago asked, can you please do 4K uploads? I'd like to see your hair in as much detail as possible. Well, Chettle, uh, good news for you. We upgraded cameras, so we talked about this in a separate video, but new cameras there, uh, 4K is now a thing we can do, 4K 60, because I can't stand 30 FPS. So uh, I guess your wish has been fulfilled. Thank you for commenting. As always, you can leave questions below for next time. And let us know what you think about what Intel's up to. Curious to see what, what you all think. Subscribe for more. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus stops out directly or store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our freshly restocked Tri-Blend shirts. They come from the same people that do uh, Paul and Kyle's shirts. So if you know the quality and material of theirs, then you know the quality and material of ours. Unless you think Kyle's shirts are bad because he's murdering CPUs with that CPU cooler. If you've seen that design, I'll see you all next time.